The Lockheed P-38 Lightning arrived in Europe in late 1942 with a reputation that preceded it like thunder. With twin engines, twin booms, and a top speed of over 400 miles per hour, it looked like nothing else in the sky. American commanders believed it would dominate the Luftwaffe just as it had in the Pacific, where it had proven devastatingly effective. But when the first squadrons arrived in England, the reports that filtered back from combat were not of dominance, they were of disaster. Within months, pilots were filing after-action reports filled with frustration, mechanical failures, and unexplained crashes. Pilots who should have returned from missions never did, their empty chairs haunting debriefing rooms across airfields in England. The issue revealed itself during high-altitude intercepts, where the P-38 was supposed to excel. When Lightning pilots spotted German fighters below and pushed into a dive, they expected their superior speed to carry them through the attack. But something terrifying happened around 500 miles per hour. The control yoke froze solid, the aircraft's nose tucked down of its own accord, and the dive steepened uncontrollably. Airspeed surged past 550, then 600 miles per hour, and the entire airframe began shaking violently, as if tearing itself apart. Some pilots managed to recover through sheer luck and strength. Others didn't. Between October 1943 and January 1944, the 55th Fighter Group alone lost 11 aircraft to what official? Reports coldly termed compressibility accidents. Perfectly. Functional planes dove into the English Channel or the French countryside. No enemy fire, no engine failure, just the mysterious hand of physics reaching out to destroy them. Compressibility was a concept barely understood at the time. In theory, Lockheed's engineers knew it existed. But theory lived in wind tunnels and technical papers, not in the chaos of combat at 25,000 feet. What those pilots were encountering was their aircraft nearing the speed of sound, around Mach 0.68 where airflow over the wings began forming shock waves. Those shock waves robbed the tail of authority. The horizontal stabilizer, mounted between the lightning's twin booms, sat in disturbed, turbulent air. The elevators stopped responding. The aircraft became a 16,000-pound glider locked in a terminal dive, leaving the pilot helpless, watching the altimeter spin and praying for a miracle. The Luftwaffe noticed. German pilots, masters of aerial tactics honed against hurricanes and spitfires, soon realized that if they could bait a P-38 into a dive, they could often escape or even watch the American fighter crash without firing a shot. They developed a new tactic. When chased by lightnings, they dove in controlled spirals, forcing the Americans to follow into the danger zone of compressibility. By mid-1943, these diving spirals became standard German doctrine. It wasn't just a tactical advantage, it was psychological warfare. P-38 pilots began to hesitate. Knowing that aggression could kill them faster than the enemy's guns, morale began to fracture. These weren't cowardly men. They were volunteers who had crossed an ocean to fight. But they were flying an aircraft that punished their bravery. By summer 1943, the P-38's reputation in Europe was in ruins. Some squadrons were quietly reassigned to lower-altitude ground attack roles or transferred to the Mediterranean, where the thinner air was less deadly. The Lightning, once a symbol of American innovation, had become a liability. And then, in late October 1943, desperation produced discovery. The exact name of the first pilot remains debated. Some say it was Captain Robin Olds, Others, an unknown member of the 55th Fighter Group. But, whoever he was, he changed the P-38's fate forever. During a high-speed dive, as his controls began freezing and the aircraft started to tuck downward, he did something unthinkable. He shut off one engine. The result was instantaneous. The violent buffeting smoothed out, the nose responded again, and the lightning, though still screaming earthward, remained controllable. He pulled out safely. Back on the ground, his squadron thought he was insane. You don't shut down an engine in combat. 
they told him. Not in a dive at 500 miles per hour. But desperation breeds boldness. Within a week, three more pilots tried it, and every one of them came back alive, reporting improved control, the ability to stay with German fighters longer, and dives that no longer ended in disaster. None of them could explain why it worked. They weren't engineers, they were survivors. Yet their field innovation spread rapidly through squadrons in England, whispered at bars and briefing rooms, Kill one engine. It works. Mechanics hated it, fearing the delicate Allison engines would seize, burn, or fail to restart. Commanders didn't know whether to forbid or endorse it, but the results were undeniable. Pilots who used the technique were surviving and winning. When the reports finally reached Lockheed engineers in California, even the brilliant Clarence Kelly Johnson was skeptical. How could asymmetric thrust make a plane more stable? The answer lay in airflow. At high speeds, both P-38 propellers generated swirling slipstreams that combined with shock waves to batter the tail. But with one engine off, the airflow pattern changed, creating smoother, more stable conditions over the tail plane. The slight side slip induced by asymmetric thrust delayed shock wave formation buying pilots an extra 30 miles per hour of controllable dive speed. Engineering officer Harold Birkeland of the 55th Fighter Group even quantified it. Shutting down one engine reduced tail pressure distortion by up to 22% between Mach 0.65 and R.70 that Lockheed test pilots confirmed it in California dive trials, what combat pilots had, discovered through instinct was scientifically valid. By early 1944, the U.S. 8th Air Force could no longer ignore the results. Official training began at Boxted Airfield in Essex. Pilots learned to shut down one engine in level flight, then in shallow dives, then finally in full combat simulations. The process had to become muscle memory. When to cut power. When to restart. Which engine to use. By March 8, 1944, the single-engine dive was officially sanctioned as a tactical maneuver, with detailed instructions issued under Technical Order 0175F1B1. Its effectiveness became legend almost overnight. On March 15, 1944, 2nd Lieutenant Robert Anderson used the maneuver to chase down and destroy a Messerschmitt BF-10A9 over Augsburg one of the first confirmed kills attributed to the technique. Within two weeks, half a dozen more victories followed. The P-38's curse had been broken. For the first time in months, pilots dove with confidence. Aggression returned to the Lightning's cockpit. The Luftwaffe noticed, confused and unsettled as American fighters began staying on their tails through dives that once guaranteed escape. By May 1944, German intelligence finally pieced together what was happening after recovering a downed P-38 pilot's notebook describing single-engine high-speed dives. Tactics were quickly revised. Steeper brakes, harder turns, and attempts to force lightnings to consume altitude faster. But the psychological advantage was gone. The P-38's pilots were back in the fight. During the Normandy campaign, they achieved near parity in aerial engagements that would once have been one-sided. As the war progressed, the P-51 Mustang eventually replaced the Lightning in escort duties, thanks to its superior high-speed aerodynamics. But the legacy of the P-38 single-engine dive lived on. Post-war engineers at Lockheed, NACA, and the Air Force studied the phenomenon intensively. They learned that the P-38's tail design was inherently flawed for transonic flight, leading to new configurations for high-speed aircraft. Tails placed above wing turbulence, as seen in later jets and reconnaissance planes. More importantly, they learned a deeper lesson. Innovation doesn't always come from laboratories. Sometimes it comes from desperate men at 22,000 feet, improvising under fire. The P-38 never became the ultimate European air superiority fighter that planners had dreamed of, but it became something more meaningful. A case study in adaptation, in courage, in the human ability to solve problems no textbook had yet defined. 
Hundreds of pilots came home alive because one of them dared to try the unthinkable. Shutting down an engine in the middle of combat. One act of desperation turned into doctrine, reshaping how engineers and aviators alike understood the frontier between man and machine. In the end, the P-38 story isn't just about technology. It's about the pilot who refused to accept that death was inevitable and found a way to make the lightning fly true again. One shutdown engine and one controlled dive at a time.